you are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 27 of By the Book. I'm glad you're listening. I hope you've been listening. I hope you'll stick with us as we work through some kind of heavy stuff here in the scriptures. But ultimately, we're talking about the rapture. We're talking about when it's going to occur. We're talking about why it occurs at all. But we suggested to you last time you can't understand the prophecy unless you understand the history. And so we've been talking about some historical things that will yield to prophecy and prophetic fulfillment. And uh, I hope uh, you're kind of taking it in and getting hold of it and getting excited about it. I love it personally. I, I hope you do too. Well, last time we saw that our Lord Jesus was rejected when he offered himself as the Messiah, Prince of Israel. Just as Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9 said, after the public officer of himself as the Christ, he was crucified. Before he was crucified, he told Jerusalem, representing the nation of Israel, that they were being left desolate, and they would not see him again until they said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Also, he met with his disciples on the night before he was crucified and told them he would not drink the fruit of the vine with them until he drank it new with them in his father's kingdom. The next day, he was crucified. However, there are still seven years of Daniel's prophecy from Daniel chapter 9 to be fulfilled. There is the promise of eventual everlasting righteousness from Daniel 9.24, along with other things that we find in that verse. And there is the promise of the new covenant when all Israel shall be saved. So here they are, uh, left desolate, and uh, their Savior uh, crucified. What, What happens next? Well. In less than a week from his public presentation as Messiah Prince, the crowds had been professing to accept him. He was crucified. All the excitement of what we call Palm Sunday, and in less than a week, he's crucified. On the third day, however, as you know, he arose from the dead. For 40 days, he ministered to his disciples. Then he told them to stay in Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit would come. We find that in Acts chapter 1. Then he led them out to the Mount of Olives, and he ascended into heaven. They saw him go up. When he ascended into heaven, he left Jerusalem, and he left Israel desolate. They will not see him again until he comes to set up his kingdom. Israel was set aside, as Paul said in Romans 11, 5 to 7, though there is a continuing small remnant of Jewish believers in this age, and I quote, the rest were blinded. There is a remnant of Jewish believers. The rest are blinded. The nation of Israel still spiritually desolate and blinded. And that nation awaits the final seven years of Daniel's prophecy. So we came to a time when Israel, the chosen people of God, spiritually desolate, spiritually blind. Seven years yet to be fulfilled from Daniel's prophecy. There was still the promise of a king and a kingdom. In fact, there was the specific promise of Gabriel in Luke's gospel preceding the birth of Christ, and I love this, that he would be great, would be called the son of the highest, the Lord God would give unto him the throne of his father David, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, 
and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And again, as we said, still the promise hanging out there, as it were, of the new covenant of salvation for Israel. All those things would come and will come sometime in the future. But again, what was God going to do next? The Christ has been killed, arose from the dead, and he returned to heaven. Ten days after Christ ascended to heaven, a dramatic event occurred on the day of Pentecost. Now, you might know about it. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. Remember that in Matthew 16, 18, the Lord Jesus told his disciples he would build his church. The night before his crucifixion, he told his disciples, as recorded in John 14, stated again in John 15, stated again in verse or John 16, that he was leaving, but he would send the Holy Spirit to them. After his resurrection, he gave his apostles the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But again, Acts 1, verses 4 to 5, just before his ascension, he told his disciples, stay in Jerusalem until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting that at this point, the apostles asked him this question. Here's the Lord Jesus standing before them, the Messiah Prince, the resurrected Christ. And here's what they ask him. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is now the time you're going to set up the kingdom? His answer in Acts 1, 7 and 8 was this. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, his own authority. But you shall receive power, dynamic power, dunamis, after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So again, his answer was, no, I am not setting up the kingdom now. But you are going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the great commission that I gave you to preach the gospel all over the world. Now listen, folks. It is critical to our understanding of Scripture that we know what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. If you and I don't get this, if people don't get this, they, they end up in confusion. Acts 2, you can read these things. Acts 2 tells us that the apostles were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That term filled means to be under control of the Holy Spirit. You and I are challenged to be filled, really, from Ephesians 5. It's to allow ourselves to be filled. Allow yourself to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So Acts 2, that happens to the apostles. But the Lord Jesus had told them they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. We need to know what that is. You get to Acts chapter 10. Remember, Peter was called to the house of Cornelius in Caesarea. He didn't want to go. But Peter acknowledged in Acts chapter 10 that the house of Cornelius had believed the gospel, this Gentile, had believed the gospel and received the Spirit, just like the apostles did. He received the Spirit. Now, that was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The apostles had actually received the Holy Spirit on the night of Christ's resurrection in John 20, 22. You can see it there. But the Lord Jesus said in Acts 1, they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then Acts chapter 11, verses 15 and 16, Peter stated that he recognized that Cornelius and his household had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
And he said he remembered that the Lord Jesus had promised that the apostles would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Peter recognized that on the day of Pentecost, the apostles had been filled by the Spirit and had been baptized by the Spirit. And according to John 20, 22, they had already received the Holy Spirit. For Cornelius, they all happened at the same time. But listen, they are not all the same thing. And again, I want to focus on that. Because you go into the Old Testament, and you'll find people who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, some for their whole life, some temporarily for special purposes. You'll find uh, people in the Old Testament who were filled. They were brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. But listen, you will find no one in the Old Testament who was baptized by the Holy Spirit. So what's that mean? What's this all about? Well. Thankfully, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13, Paul gave us clarity on the unique work of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you. Paul wrote this. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For, read it now, or listen to it, for by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Paul makes it clear, don't miss this. The Spirit of God baptizes all believers into the body of Christ. Now, remember the word baptize? What's it mean? There's a lot of confusion about it today because of certain churches, they, they pour, they sprinkle, whatever. The term baptize means to place into or immerse. So when Paul says that we've all been baptized into one body, it means we have been all placed into one body, and that body is the body of Christ. Now, let's get some more confirmation. Listen to Colossians 1, 18a, just the first part of the verse. Paul wrote, for he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. See that? Okay, we have people being placed into the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is what? The church. Listen to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The Father, quote, hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. You're hearing it. I hope you'll turn to the scriptures. See it. See it clearly. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. Colossians 1, 18, first part of the verse. Then Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The church is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. When the Spirit of God baptizes you, he places you into the body of Christ, which is the church. See it clearly. We get into that spiritual body of Christ by the baptizing work of the Spirit. The spiritual body of Christ is the church. Now, the first time that ever happened was on the day of Pentecost. That means the church, and therefore the church age, began on the day of Pentecost. Where are we in God's plan? What's going on? At this point, the nation of Israel has been set aside in blindness and left desolate. God will not deal with them again until the final seven years of Daniel's 490-year prophecy. 
Only then will God finish his work with Israel. Right now, Israel has been set aside and God has begun something brand new and different, the church. It began on the day of Pentecost. And since Pentecost, the church has been the focus of God's spiritual work. Israel is set aside. Israel is blinded. Israel is desolate. But before them, in the future, are these unchanging promises of God. The last seven years of the prophecy of Daniel, it'll happen. The new covenant, it will happen. Christ setting up his kingdom, it will happen. But right now, we're in a different time. God is doing a different work. Since the day of Pentecost, The church has been the focus of God's work, and the church has been mostly made up of Gentiles. There are Jewish believers, praise the Lord, but where do they fit in? Well, they are just a remnant. As we saw in Romans 11, verses 5 to 7, remnant means a small number, means that which is left over. Israel as a whole is blinded, but there is a small number that will believe. Now, we see that in Scripture. We, we kind of see how that developed, and I want to point it out to you. We see it clearly, for instance, in Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas preached in Antioch. The Jews did not respond well to the message, but the Gentiles wanted to hear it. The Jews then reacted against Paul and Barnabas and the Gentiles. Listen, verse 44 to 48. Here's what it says. And the next day, the next Sabbath day, came almost the whole city, city of Antioch, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. When the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy, and they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now listen to what Paul goes on to say. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, and here Paul quotes from Isaiah 42, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's Paul quoting from Isaiah 42. And then he goes on and says this, the text says this, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of God and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So here's Paul. He was going preaching to the Jews, always went to the Jews first, always went to the synagogues when there was one, always tried to reach the Jews. But he comes to a point and he says to the Jews, you obviously don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We're going to start ministering to the Gentiles. And he even quoted scripture to to back it up. Then Paul said this in Galatians 2, as he wrote about some of these issues, he said that the apostles had recognized that God, and I quote, wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So the church is made up primarily of Gentiles with just a small number of Jews. The time will come, however, listen, the time will come when the church and the church age will be complete, and the Lord will then turn to finish his work with the nation of Israel in perfect harmony with the prophecy of Daniel 9. Now, we have to stop there for today, but I want you to see this picture. God worked with the Jews. They rejected Christ. He said, okay, I'm setting you aside. Still have those promises out there, Seven more years of Daniel 9's prophecy, the new covenant, the kingdom, 
Those are still hanging out there for Israel. That's still yet to come. But then God turns to the Gentiles and he says, now I'm going to build my church. There will be a remnant of Jewish believers. A few will be saved. He said, but I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. I'm going to build my church. You and I are living in that time right now. And you and I are looking forward to the rapture. But we want to talk more about this and see this as completely as we can. So we'll pick up next time. Lord bless you till then.